Hello, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Conservation Adaptation Resources Toolbox, or CART. My name is Haley Crocker, and I am a case study author interning with CART and the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. For anyone unfamiliar, CART is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge sharing and co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species. CART supports different communities of practice, including the non-native aquatic species community of practice that we launched in May of 2020. If you would like more information on CART or our communities of practice, please feel free to email Carly Jewell. We'll drop her email in the chat here momentarily. And then we're, today we're going to uh, host a presentation from Susan Wood, a fish biologist with Grand Canyon National Park, who will talk about exploring the use of ammonia as a tool for removal of invasive crayfish. Susan has worked as a park interpreter and fisheries technician in the Southwest since 2010 and recently completed her master's in environmental sciences and policy at Northern Arizona University. For her thesis, Susan worked on the control of invasive crayfish species in Arizona with funding and input from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's non-native aqu aquatic species community of practice. She is now a fish biologist with the National Park Service and is working on native and invasive fish, fish management in the Grand Canyon region. As a final reminder, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box and I will relay them to the speakers after the presentation. With that, Susan, we are ready for you to start. Okay, thanks um, Haley and Carly. Um, I'll just share my screen here. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for joining today. Um, as Haley said, my name is Susan. I was working on my master's project investigating ammonia as a potential chemical removal tool for invasive crayfish. And on that project, I was working with um, Rebecca Best, my advisor, and also David Ward, who was working for USGS at the time, but now he's working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so today I'm going to give some introduction and background about crayfish and ammonia and the trials that I did for this project, um, go through the results from those trials, and then hopefully have some time for questions and some discussion at the end. Oh. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, so invasive crayfish are a pretty big issue, not just here in the Southwest and in North America, but also globally all over the world. And there are a couple characteristics of invasive crayfish that make them really successful invaders. Um, first one is that they are omnivorous. So crayfish eat plants, they eat animals, they eat detritus. They eat basically anything, and this enables them to impact multiple levels of a food web. Some crayfish species are considered ecological engineers, um, so they can completely alter an ecosystem. Some crayfish do this by digging and burrowing. Um, others do this by overeating detritus and changing the composition of a system. Crayfish can also survive out of water for some time, which makes them really difficult from a control perspective, but it also enables them to travel between water systems. And lastly, they are large invertebrates, and large invertebrates can have a big impact on an ecosystem, especially if that system doesn't already have a niche for large invertebrates. And that is the case here in Arizona. Um, Arizona is the only state in the lower 48 that does not have a native species of crayfish. But we do have two invasive species now, the northern crayfish, Faxonius virilis, and the red swamp crayfish, Procamberus clarkii. So the northern crayfish is native to that area in gold and the map on the left there. Um, so the Mississippi River drainage and the northern Midwestern United States and southern Canada. 
And those areas in brown are all the places where it is now invasive in North America. Um, and if you look at the map on the right, you'll see it's pretty widespread in Arizona, and it is the species that is established here in Flagstaff. Um, so it's the species that I did most of my trials and experimentation on. And <clears throat> the red swamp crayfish is native to that area in gold in this map. So the southern United States and northern Mexico and those areas in brown are all the places it's invasive now in North America. And it's not quite as widespread in Arizona as the northern crayfish. It's kind of further south. Um, but it is more widespread globally. The red swamp crayfish is now found on five continents and it is wreaking havoc in Europe and Asia and Africa. And it's become a, a pretty big concern as an invasive species. Okay, so efforts to control invasive crayfish haven't been terribly successful. Um, the most commonly employed methods have been mechanical removal, specifically trapping. And mechanical removal is never going to remove all of the individuals in a population. Um, and I put this study up here because I feel like it kind of exemplifies that um, with crayfish. Uh, this study was done in the UK where they have a pretty big invasive signal crayfish problem. That's the crayfish in the picture that's outside of the trap. Um, signal crayfish are native to North America, but they were introduced in Europe and are um, decimating native crayfish populations over there. They're really big and aggressive. Um, and so this study was looking at this population of signal crayfish and they realized that only about two percent of this population they were surveying um, was actually large enough to be caught in traps. So two percent um, isn't going to make much of a difference when you're trying to decrease a population. So I thought that was interesting. There has been some really interesting work done with biocides um, or chemicals used to target invasive species. Uh, both of these studies on the slide are also in Europe and they were looking at pyrethroids, which are insecticides that target arthropods. And so they work pretty well on crayfish, but biocides in general are pretty controversial. There are no species specific biocides. There are definitely no crayfish specific biocides. Typically any chemicals that you add to a system are going to affect many different organisms. But that said, biocides might be one of the few tools that could locally eradicate um, species or un unwanted invasives. And so we were interested in whether ammonia could be one such biocide. Um, there were a couple features of ammonia that we thought might make it worth investigation. The first is that it's naturally occurring. Many aquatic species produce and excrete ammonia. And because of that, it breaks down naturally in aquatic systems via the nitrogen cycle. Um, ammonia is also toxic at higher concentrations, and that toxicity can be manipulated by changing water chemistry and water temperature. So there's two forms of ammonia in aqueous solutions. There's NH4+, the ionized form, and NH3, the unionized form. Uh, NH3 is considered the toxic form of ammonia, because it doesn't have that charge and it will readily pass through um, cell membranes and gill structures and enter the bodies of aquatic organisms. But it's usually not present at very high concentrations. So if you look at this graph on the right, you'll see why. Um, so most aquatic systems have a pretty neutral pH of around eight which would only put your percentage of unionized ammonia at less than 10%. But if you were to increase your pH, you could increase your percentage of unionized ammonia 
to 60 or 70 or close to 80%, maybe even 90 if you were working in warmer water temperatures. And that relationship is just a function of increasing the pH decreases the amount of hydrogen ions that are available to bind to ammonia. So with higher pH, there's less um, H plus and less NH4 plus. So like I mentioned, NH3 is considered toxic because it will readily enter the bodies of aquatic organisms. And it does that mostly through the gills. So crayfish have gills. They are located under the carapace and they work just like fish gills in that oxygenated water passes over the gill structures and then oxygenated blood can then be transported throughout the body. Um, and this is the same mechanism for how NH3 enters the body. Um, and it's also how aquatic organisms excrete the ammonia they produce, um, especially crayfish. Most of their NH3 that they produce is excreted through the gills. So when you, when you increase the ambient NH3 in the water, you're not only um, bringing more NH3 into the body of the crayfish, but they're also having a hard time excreting it because they're usually excreting it down this partial pressure gradient. And with high ambient amounts of ammonia, that gradient is weakened. So they're bringing more into their body. They're having a hard time excreting it. And so ammonia is building up in the body and it can be toxic and eventually fatal. But of course, um, one thing to mention is that because it enters through the gills, ammonia will affect organis any organism that has gills, not just crayfish. Okay, so before I started this master's project, um, Eric Fry was working on his master's on a very similar project, looking at ammonia as a potential tool for invasive fish. Um, and Eric was able to um, cause 100% mortality of three invasive fish species in Arizona, the fathead minnow, the green sunfish, and the black bullhead catfish um, in the laboratory with pretty low concentrations of ammonia. And so he showed that it definitely has promise as a tool um, for invasive fish, but we were interested in whether it could also be used for invasive crayfish. And so the big question of this whole research project was, can ammonia be used as a tool for removal of invasive crayfish? And to answer this question, I had three sub-questions that I wanted to answer. The first of which was, what is the lowest effective dose of ammonia and additives that will achieve 100% mortality in a lab setting? We hypothesized that there are other substances that can increase the efficacy of ammonia as a tool, such as sodium carbonate to increase pH and sodium sulfite to lower dissolved oxygen levels. So to begin answering these questions, I first had to do a series of preliminary trials in the fall of 2021, just to see if this would even work and to start kind of figuring out the formulation that I was going to use. So pretty early on, I was using this formulation of ammonium sulfate, sodium carbonate as my pH increaser and sodium sulfite, which lowers dissolved oxygen. Eric also used sodium sulfite in his experiments with the thinking that if you lower the dissolved oxygen in the water, then fish or crayfish would be trying to get oxygen and moving more water over their gills, um, but thus taking in more ammonia that way. So I started with pretty low amounts of sodium sulfite and I was getting pretty low mortality initially, but having a higher dose of sodium sulfite did seem to make a difference. So then I started increasing my doses of all the components. I doubled the ammonia, I increased the sodium carbonate, and I increased the sodium sulfite quite a lot. And I was finally starting to get 100% mortality over a 24 hour period, um, but only with the formulations that contained sodium sulfite. 
So then I was interested in whether sodium sulfite might work just on its own. So I did a trial with just sodium sulfite and got zero mortality um, over several days, which wasn't terribly surprising because crayfish can still get oxygen from the air as long as their gills are wet. So I suspect they were just coming up to the surface and breathing air that way when I wasn't looking. Um, but we did decide that this formulation that we had started with, um, we would move forward with it and start tweaking some of the concentrations. So my next several trials were trying to refine the amount of ammonia that I was using. Um, like I mentioned, ammonia breaks down naturally in aquatic systems, but it does still persist, um, sometimes for a few weeks, sometimes for a few months, depending on the conditions of the water and temperature. Um, so we wanted to bring that amount of ammonia that we were using down as much as possible. So I started doing these refinement trials, um, starting with the lowest ammonia dose from the preliminary trials and using two lower doses as well. Um, this dose of sodium carbonate increased the pH to about 9.5. And this was the concentration of sodium sulfite that would lower the dissolved oxygen in the water to zero and then keep it there for about 24 hours. So I was catching lots of crayfish, um, mostly in Lake Mary, which is just outside of Flagstaff here. There are a ton of northern crayfish in that lake. So that was very nice to have this great crayfish source so close by. Um, usually I was catching them with baited hoop nets. And then I'd bring them back to the Rocky Mountain Research um, Greenhouse and Laboratory Facility here in Flagstaff. And I was conducting the trials in these tanks that you see in this picture. So each tank had 100 gallons of water um, and 10 crayfish. Um, and I had six replicates of each treatment, each treatment being that different concentration of ammonia. And I'd leave the tanks for 24 hours, checking them every six hours or so for mortality, removing um, dead crayfish. And at the end of these trials, I was able to achieve 100% or very nearly 100% mortality with all three doses of ammonia in the lab. So that was pretty promising considering many of my preliminary trials had hardly any mortality. So this was a good sign. Um, but next I was interested in whether I could still get high mortality if the crayfish were able to escape the water, or if they had some kind of refuge. So I started conducting escape trials, um, which were basically the same tanks um, but with a five gallon bucket filled with fresh water and a little escape ramp up to the bucket. Um, and for these trials, I also had control tanks that didn't have any chemicals added to basically see if crayfish would escape, whether there were chemicals or not. And pretty much the same setup as the ammonia um, refinement trials, 10 crayfish per tank, had the little escape bucket, and then ended up being three replicates per treatment or per different concentration of ammonia. And so I'd leave this trial for 24 hours. I didn't want to check on the crayfish and discourage them from getting up on the ramp. Um, and at the end of those 24 hours, um, none of the northern crayfish in the treatment tanks escaped. In fact, most of them died after 24 hours, and most of the crayfish in the control tanks escaped into the fresh water bucket. Um, pretty consistently, about two-thirds of the crayfish were found in the escape bucket the next morning. Um, so again, pretty promising. That, um, I was thinking after these that maybe this formulation of ammonia was strong enough to prevent the crayfish from trying to escape. It would incapacitate them fairly quickly before they could try to figure out how to get out of the water. So our next question was, 
is there a difference in ammonia sensitivity between northern crayfish and red swamp crayfish, those two invasive species in Arizona? We hypothesized that because of their different life history traits, um, these two species might have different sensitivities to high ammonia concentrations. Specifically, red swamp crayfish rely more he heavily on burrows. And so we thought they might be exposed to higher concentrations of ammonia in the burrows and thus might be less sensitive to ammonia. So I wanted to start conducting these same ammonia trials with red swamp crayfish, but this is where it got a little tricky because there are no red swamp crayfish here in Flagstaff. And I couldn't exactly bring this highly invasive crayfish species, travel with it, bring it to a place where it wasn't already established. So I basically had to find the red swamp crayfish and go to them and conduct the trials where they already were. Um, so luckily, <clears throat> last year I did a talk for when it was Seacast, um, and that talk put me in touch with Tracy Nelson, who works at the Rancho Hamul Ecological Reserve in Southern California. Um, at the time, she was the reserve manager and was kind of transitioning into this position as the invasive, invasive species manager. So she very graciously invited me to California to try my formulation on the their red swamp crayfish population on this reserve. So I packed up the tanks, they travel really well, which was nice, and drove to Rancho Hummel Ecological Reserve, which is pretty close to San Diego in Southern California. And I was able to set up my mobile lab on the property um, right by the pool, which was really nice. Um, kind of hard to see in this picture, but there's a giant pool in the background and there's this really great pool area and roofed cabana area where I was able to put all my tanks and run my experiment there. Um, this is all part of this ranch house that's on the property that was donated and the state of California and Fish and Wildlife have since put um, offices in this building, but it was really nice for me because it was very hot in early September when I was there, so could run the experiments and then jump in the pool when it got too hot. So that was really very nice. Um, and I tried to set this trial up as much like the Northern Crayfish trial as I could, but there were a couple differences. Um, I was using the same formulation. So those three concentrations of ammonium sulfate and then the same concentrations of sodium carbonate and sodium sulfite. I did have two control tanks that didn't have any chemicals added. Mostly because um, the red swamp crayfish were being caught in the creek and brought to the tanks, and they really only had about an hour of acclimation time, whereas the crayfish I was catching in Flagstaff had a few days to acclimate. So I wanted to make sure that mortality wasn't being caused by um, the stress of capture and transport. And because we were a little strapped for time, we really could only run one trial. Um, so I wanted to maximize that time. So instead of 10 crayfish in each tank, I had 20. So there were 20 crayfish per tank and then two replicates per treatment or two replicates of each concentration of ammonia. And so at the end of that 24 hour trial, I was not able to achieve 100% mortality um, of red swamp crayfish. Uh, I only got to about 90% over the 24 hours compared to the 100% mortality that we got with the northern crayfish in Flagstaff. So I wanted to look at these differences um, a little more closely and decided to do a survival analysis. Survival analyses are time to event analyses that give you a probability of surviving past a certain time point. Um, they incorporate censored individuals, which are basically the individuals that do not experience the event, in this case, death. 
Um, and they also create this nice survival curve. This is not the curve that I got from my trials. Um, I just wanted to put it up here as an example. So each point on that curve is a probability of surviving past that time point. It's also interested in the survival analysis because you can compare survival between groups, which is what I really wanted to do between the two species of crayfish. So my survival curve looked like this. It's a little um, chunky because we're checking in these time blocks, but you can see there is much lower survival for the northern crayfish in blue there than the red swamp crayfish in gold. So the probability for a northern crayfish um, of surviving past 24 hours was about 1%, whereas for a red swamp crayfish, it was 13%. So I wanted to know if these were real significant differences. So we ran that group um, differences analysis, which is a log rank test, and found that, yes, that is a pretty significant difference between 1% and 13% for these two species. I also ran this analysis for the other groups, so the ammonia doses, um, the size classes, which Really, all of our crayfish were pretty similar size, so we weren't expecting too much of a difference. Um, but survival differences in sex was starting to get pretty close um, to having a lower and significant p-value there, um, with females tending to have a higher um, survival than males. So then I was interested in whether we would see these same results if we changed the time period. So if we looked at the survival differences at six hours as opposed to 24 hours. Um, we're still getting some pretty good oops, survival differences between the species and the differences between ammonia, although not significant, was starting to move that direction with um, there being lower survival for the higher ammonia doses than the lower. But looking at these two tables, especially looking at the species values there, you would think, huh, there does seem to be a difference um, in survival and perhaps in ammonia sensitivity between these two species. But after looking at some of the other parameters we were collecting and, and looking at, we decided that we couldn't really make that conclusion, um, mostly because there were the, some kind of big differences between the water in these two locations. So if you remember, all of the northern crayfish used in these trials were being caught and experimented on in Flagstaff, and all of the red swan crayfish were being caught and experimented on in Southern California at Rancho Hamul. Um, driving, that is a distance of about 467 miles, and that is pretty far and can make some pretty big differences in the water that we were using. So we were adding the same amounts of ammonia. So our total ammonia and nitrogen concentrations were pretty similar between the two species trials, um, as was our temperature, even though there was more variation in the Northern crayfish trials in blue there, um, and slightly higher temperatures for the red swamp crayfish. But where we really saw the big difference was with the pH. Um, the northern crayfish trials here in Flagstaff had a consistently higher pH of about 0.5 than the red swamp crayfish trials. And if you guys remember that slide from earlier, how important pH is to that relationship of um, ionized and unionized ammonia. So even though our total ammonia and nitrogen levels are similar, our unionized unionized ammonia levels were a little bit different, especially for those two higher doses of ammonia. So <clears throat> the red swamp crayfish just weren't experiencing um, as much NH3 as the northern crayfish were. We also were observing this behavior in the red swamp crayfish trials that we weren't really seeing with the northern crayfish trials. And that was many more crayfish up at the surface um, trying to breathe air. Those are all crayfish. 
Um, which again, wasn't very surprising. If you look at some previous studies on red swamp crayfish, they are pretty sensitive to oxygen levels. And people have found that if you lower the dissolved oxygen in the water to three milligrams per liter, um, red swamp crayfish will start to emerge from the water and start, start trying to leave it. And we were lowering the oxygen to zero. So not surprising that the crayfish were coming up to the surface to try to get oxygen. But of course, if they're up at the surface breathing air, um, they're not going to be taking in as much ammonia um, that way either. So they, with the lower pH and then also more red salt crayfish at the surface, um, they probably just weren't being exposed to quite the levels of ammonia that the northern crayfish were. And our final question in this project was, will laboratory doses of ammonia and additives cause 100% mortality in a field setting? We hypothesized that mortality rates might be less in a field setting than what can be achieved in laboratory experiments. Um, and that's pretty standard for many other studies with chemical treatments. There are just many more factors in a real world or field setting that can affect the toxicity of a biocide than what you can control for in the lab. <clears throat> so when I was at Rancho Hamul um, doing my mobile lab experiment with red swamp crayfish, I was also able to conduct a field trial while I was there. I did want to put some pictures up of the property because it is so beautiful there, even though I was supposedly there at the crispiest and worst time of the year. It was very dry and there were a lot of fires going on. You can see some smoke in the background of that picture on the left. Um, but that picture on the left, that is Hamul Creek running through the property. And the property also has a series of ponds like this one on the right. And these aquatic systems at Rancho Hamul are just dominated by invasive species. In the creek, they have a red swamp crayfish problem. And in the ponds, they have a bunch of African clawed frogs. Uh, and these two invasives are making it really difficult for some of the native species to thrive and recruit and survive and all that. So they're pretty interested in trying new techniques to tackle their invasive species problem. So the pond that I got to do a treatment in was this pond. Um, it's this small stock pond on the property that they call the corral pond. So we went in a few days before and put this silt fencing in to try to thwart any escaping crayfish. And we also put these trash cans in, which were trash cans with the bottoms cut off and that were then augered into the mud um, to serve as a control um, because the water inside the cans would ideally not be getting any of the chemical treatment that was happening outside of the cans. So there were 10 cans and each can had six loose crayfish inside, and also a minnow trap with the entrances closed off containing six crayfish as well. So those crayfish would not be exposed to the treatment and were our control crayfish. And each can also had a corresponding minnow trap outside of it with six crayfish that was being exposed to the treatment. Um, here are those minnow traps. So we either zip tied the entrances closed so the crayfish couldn't escape or we stuffed styrofoam in there um, so they'd stay in the trap. We also added about 480 loose crayfish to the pond um, to kind of get an idea of what mortality would look like when they could move about freely. And I was also interested in what the escape an emergence would look like if all the crayfish would just try to leave the water when we dosed it. So after that pond trial, we were able to draw some conclusions. Um, all of the crayfish in the treatment traps were dead in the first six hours, and there was no mortality of crayfish in the control cans over 24 hours. The majority of loose crayfish in the pond were dead in 24 hours, um, but throughout the um, trial, we did notice many crayfish 
out of the water, either climbing up onto the algal mats, like in the pictures here, or um, crawling up onto shore. And two live crayfish were found after the trial. One was found after six days, and one was found after two weeks. Also, a heart estimated ammonia dose was about four times higher than what we were um, achieving in the laboratory concentrations. And that was just a function of me kind of overestimating how much water was in this pond and not really getting a, a very accurate um, estimate of water volume, which is just kind of speaks to it's just difficult to do and any kind of field trials are going to have difficulties like that. Um, but many um, previous studies with biocides and chemical treatments um, or even current chemical treatments of invasive species often increase their doses to make sure that they are effective from anywhere um, to from two times higher to 10 times higher the laboratory concentration. So um, even though we weren't really trying to increase the <laughs> concentrations, it wasn't totally crazy amount higher than um, the lab concentrations. Okay, so what did we learn from all these trials and all these crayfish? Well, um, we learned that a formulation of ammonium sulfate, sodium carbonate, and sodium sulfite can achieve 100% mortality of northern crayfish in the lab. Um, that same formulation can also achieve 90% mortality of red swamp crayfish. And we also learned um, from the escape trials that northern crayfish might not emerge from the water when exposed to an ammonia treatment, but definitely be worth more investigation. And we were able to achieve mortality of the majority of crayfish in that pond treatment. Um, many chemical treatments view any kind of survival as a complete failure. We did have those two live crayfish um, several days and two weeks later, um, but I like to think of it in terms of that study that I talked about early on where they were trying to trap invasive crayfish and were really only able to catch 2% of the population. So when you compare it to uh, a method like that, two crayfish out of several hundred surviving um, is pretty good odds, I think. Okay, so what is next for ammonia as a removal tool? Um, well, it would be pretty important to conduct additional field trials. We were only able to do one, um, and it'd be interesting and really useful to conduct more trials in different sites with different characteristics and different species, and you could learn a lot more about this tool um, in the field by conducting more of these trials. Um, it would also be really interesting to look more into the species differences and sensitivity to ammonia and deoxygenation. Um, later on in this research, I was pretty interested in the deoxygenation part uh, because um, so most crayfish species, especially red swamp crayfish, are pretty sensitive to low, um, low oxygen levels. But northern crayfish are not, um, and they're kind of unique that way. Um, in their native range, they spend long winter months under the ice in pretty low oxygen conditions, and they just enter this state of torpor over the winter. And I think that is maybe what was happening in my trials with northern crayfish. Um, they weren't trying to escape the water. They were just kind of hunkering down. Um, and I think that could be pretty important if you're going to use chemical treatments for northern crayfish. If lowering the dissolved oxygen in the water prevents them from trying to escape the water, that could be huge. Um, because crayfish emergence and escape is kind of this crux of crayfish control work. Um, makes it really difficult to target them um, and control them. So that would be another part of um, 
looking into this tool is accounting for the emergence, either making your doses high enough to prevent it or having a way to manage the escaping crayfish. Um, I also think that there's a lot more to consider with the formulation, um, trying to lower the ammonia amounts, um, and also looking into the other two components, sodium carbonate and sodium sulfite. Um, both of those are considered safe chemicals. Sodium carbonate is naturally occurring and sodium sulfite is a preservative. We eat it in many foods. Um, so there isn't a lot of information out there about what adding these chemicals to um, the environment does, but I think that is definitely should be looked into and um, considered. Okay, so there are many um, instances where a chemical treatment just isn't a good tool to use, like in this beautiful pondscape where you might have some sensitive reptile species or invertebrates or maybe even native crayfish. Um, this would not be a good place to dump a bunch of chemicals in hoping to target one species. But there are a lot of places where that isn't the case. Um, there are places where crayfish have invaded and kind of outcompeted everything else. And so there's a lot of crayfish and not much else. And these are really good places to look into some of these novel removal tools. Um, because I think one thing that most people agree on is that we're not going to find one holy grail removal tool for invasive crayfish. They're a challenging problem and it's going to take many different strategies and many different tools to be able to um, effectively control them. And so the more tools that we have at our disposal, the more successful we might be in trying to manage these invasive crayfish populations and benefit some of our native species. So with that, I would like to make a couple acknowledgements um, kind of quickly. Um, definitely want to thank all the folks in California that were so helpful with the Red Swamp Crayfish Trial, um, Tracy Nelson, and also Chris Brown and Jordan Ochoa from USGS in San Diego, and also Melissa Stepek from the state of California. They were so helpful um, with the Red Swamp Crayfish Trials and also really great people and really fun to work with. Um, also thank CART, I guess, um, and Matt Grabba for letting me give talks and get connected with amazing people that wanted to help me um, with this project, not just the folks in California, but also some people down in Phoenix. Um, at the Rio Salado Audubon Center and um, Rio Salado City Park. They were really enthusiastic about helping me catch red swamp crayfish. Um, and I did get a lot of help collecting crayfish and doing these trials um, from Eric Fry and David Ward and also my partner, Jake, who caught a lot of crayfish with me, but also made sure I was having some um, fun that had nothing to do with crayfish <laughs> during my master's. And that um, helped me be happy and sane throughout the process. So, and she's not on here, but I also want to thank Rebecca, who is my advisor and was super supportive through this whole um, process. And I learned a lot from her um, and she definitely made it a really great experience for me. So um, with that, I also want to thank all of you folks for coming today. And um, I guess we can open it up for questions. And I'll maybe stop sharing. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Susan. That was great. I learned so much. Um, we do have some comments in the chat that I'll kick us off with, uh, but definitely encourage folks to continue dropping any questions they might have into the chat or, um, you know, unmute yourself, turn your video on if you if you feel like it in and ask some questions. The first one I have is from Murray and it is, what was the water source for your experimental tanks, tap water, lake or pond, river water that the crayfish came from, et cetera? Um, yeah, in Flagstaff, it was city water. It was just kind of coming out of the tap, um, Flagstaff 
water. So we were filling the tank several days beforehand to off gas any chlorine um, and then letting the crayfish kind of acclimate in that water for a few days. And at Rancho Hamul, I think it, I'm pretty sure it's well water um, from the property. Great, thank you. <laughs> I see Teresa has a couple questions in the chat. The first one is, how did water temperature differ between the two trials? Um, yeah, it was so um, warmer in the red swamp crayfish trials, but with less variation because um, I think because we had the tanks shaded and um, it wasn't really cooling down that much at night um, at Rancho Hamul. But in Flagstaff, um, the greenhouse is in a greenhouse. So this had a lot of solar um, temperature increases during the day and then would get pretty cold at night. So from that graph early on, like the um, averages were pretty similar with the red swamp crayfish trial having a higher um, average temperature, but um, the northern crayfish trials in Flagstaff definitely like varied a lot more because they're just kind of getting more of that heating from the sun and cooling at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Teresa, jump on in. Um, so if you can hear me, I had some questions you know, related to the, the stream temperature, um, you know, tying into respiration rates for the crayfish, um, because I think that's also part of the, you know, the the timing and the, the contact and just the, you know, the ammonium or ammonia cycling. Um, and it just with that stream temperature, you know, how that may influence their the crayfish respiration rates. And then related to that, too, then considering the crayfish life cycle, um, even just with if you have young of year or if they're mainly adults or males and females or what what life stage they may be in that the, the individual crayfish may be having, you know, or have different respiration rates also. Um, like smaller crayfish potentially would would be respiring more than the adults. So I just just those kinds of things, you know, if that was part of this or if you could add that for additional research. Yeah, that would definitely be um, good to consider. Like that was something that wasn't really it was just like starting at like the with the basics right off the bat. But I did think um, we kind of wanted to be looking at different life stages initially. And then it was kind of like, well, most studies have found like small crayfish, juveniles, young of year are just so much more um, sensitive to chemicals. So let's just focus on the adults for now, because anything that's going to kill the adults is going to um, definitely kill the young ones. Um, but one thing I was kind of interested in was how, um, and I, I didn't really get a chance to explore it, but um, the like life history and molting and how that might affect crayfish sensitivity. Because early on, I was kind of like, I was doing my trials over the spring and I kind of felt like it didn't really show up in the data, but just observing it, I felt like um, crayfish were seemed more susceptible to the treatment earlier in the spring when I think they were molting. And then later they were kind of taking a little bit longer to die. And I was just thinking like that would be um, one thing to really look into if you're trying to like make a treatment much more effective um, than trying to target the crayfish when they're most vulnerable. Like when they're molting or when they're really small, really young or respir respiring more or whatever. Um, yeah, I think there's many more things that could make this a better tool and, and more efficient. And those would definitely be um, places to start for sure. Cool, thanks so much. And thanks for presenting today. Thanks, Teresa. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Uh, we have another question from Kathleen. They asked, did you track how much time elapsed before the pond went back to its pre-treatment water quality? Uh, yes, we tried to. Um, this kind of big rain event came in like just as we were finishing the treatment. 
Um, so I think the first week or so, the more water is being added to the pond, but the um, ammonia amounts were still pretty high. And then after a few weeks, it seemed I left like just one of those aquarium test kits with Tracy and she was checking it for me. Um, and so the, I think a week and two weeks still pretty high and then eventually started to get low. And I think partly it was because um, it was getting filled from the I actually think they were turned on the well a little bit and then it was raining and then it gets filled from the bottom from this well. So it was kind of lowering faster than I think it would normally when it's not getting this input from water. Um, I think after a few weeks, it was pretty low levels, like less than 10 milligrams per liter. Awesome. Thank you. Hmm? Sorry. Go for it, Haley. Um, we have another question from Liam Thompson. He asks, I may have missed this, but are there in, but are the invasive crayfish unable to be harvested for subs substance uses? Um, maybe asking that freshwater crayfish are not as enjoyable, or are they already efforts, or are there already efforts to control crayfish populations through substance harvesting? Um, that's a good question. I think people have tried it, like tried controlling crayfish populations by harvesting. Um, I think there was a big project in Flagstaff some years ago where they were trying that. Um, and I think it's, it's awesome to harvest these invasives and eat them. I'm all for that. Um, but there's some pretty good um, examples of when that might not be a great option, um, especially in the UK. Um, they wanted to really encourage people to go out and fish for signal crayfish. And it kind of backfired because while many crayfish have this great um, reaction to being harvested and that like they'll just start reproducing more and when they're younger and faster, um, they have this compensatory response, but in the UK, like having, they also tried to put like a bounty on these invasive crayfish and putting a dollar sign on this invasive species, um, made people just go out and fish for any crayfish. So they were fishing for the endangered ones. Um, they're also bringing the signal crayfish to places where they weren't already established, so they could fish for them there. And so that was a really terrible thing to happen. Um, but I, I think I think we definitely could be encouraging more crayfishing um, for people. I know people go out to Lake Mary and fish for them all the time and um, that's cool and great. But as far as like using, having that as the control method um, hasn't really worked in the past, but it, it might be a good, uh, method to use in conjunction with other methods for sure. And I think it's it would be great to do something with the crayfish. They're edible. People love eating them. So it would be a cool way to be managing them and catching them. Interesting. <laughs> um, there's a follow, there's a different question here from David. Sorry, my mind is just thinking about crayfish cookouts after they've been like removed or something. Mm -hmm. um, but David has a question about um, the red swamp crayfish, and they said that in the wild, red swamp crayfish have burrows, like you mentioned. How do you think that might affect treatments? Oh, I think this is kind of similar to the escape response in that like burrows make it really difficult to target crayfish um, because oftentimes it's the chemical treatment won't reach the burrows and they can just go enter their burrows. Some red swamp crayfish burrows get really deep um, so it's hard to treat them and if they're sensing the chemicals in the water they will just um, escape to their burrows and can stay in there for a long time for the duration of the treatment. Um, so some people at, at Auburn University are, are kind of playing around with 
um, accounting for the borough thing. Um, I think some people think like trying to draw them out of the boroughs somehow, maybe with like deoxygenation or doing something with the water might help to like get them out of the boroughs. Um, this, I really forgot his, I'm kind of blanking on his name, but a researcher at Auburn was trying all sorts of things <laughs> with the boroughs, like pouring cement in them or some of that like foamy um, insulation stuff or that just like spraying like boiling hot water in there like it's it's a challenge like that's kind of one of the uh, another really hard part about managing crayfish they can escape and live in the outside of the water and then they can escape to their burrows if they're a burrowing animal and hunker down there so it's definitely makes the treatments and targeting these populations really difficult. Really interesting. And remind me, was that, I know for the second research question in thinking about the difference in sensitivity, did you all initially think that they would be more exposed if they were like in the burrows because the ammonia would sit in there or was it the opposite? Yeah, that's what we were kind of thinking, like red swamp crayfish are in this burrow where they're excreting their ammonia, and so the ammonia levels might be higher, and so they might be less sensitive to it because of that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here, um, but want to take a moment and see if anyone else has any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, raise your hand. I'm just looking at some of the comments. Awesome. Um, I'll put my information in the chat too if anybody wants to shoot me an email. Perfect. Okay, well, then maybe I will do a quick wrap up here um, and just thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Um, this webinar was recorded and it will be available on our CART YouTube channel um, where you can find all of our previous webinars as well. Um, as always, we kind of encourage you to check out our case study dashboard. Um, we currently have 183 published case studies um, and you'll be able to find a lot of information around non-native aquatic species control. Um, our next webinar is gonna be September 12th from Stephanie Berg, who is gonna be speaking about bullfrog removal for Western pond turtles. Um, if you found this webinar, were invited to this webinar and are not yet on our uh, webinar announcements mailing list, go ahead and just send me an email. Uh, my email contact information is in the chat. And just want to thank you all for your time, especially Susan and Rebecca. Thank you so much. That was such an excellent presentation. Um, and we hope to see folks again soon.